Hello, and welcome once again to another episode of the TriDoc Podcast. I'm Jeff Sankoff, your host, the TriDoc, an emergency physician and multiple Ironman finisher, coming to you from beautiful, sunny Denver, Colorado. On a recent episode, I discussed in the opening my thoughts about the return of the Ironman Canada race to Penticton, British Columbia. For today's opening, though, I have to talk about the other side of that coin, and that is the loss of a race that was equally dear to me. That race was Ironman Boulder. Since I moved to Denver 16 years ago, I have participated in many triathlons in and around Boulder. Along with San Diego and Hawaii, Boulder really is one of those places that has to be considered a triathlon mecca, along with the many classic races that it is known for, including the Boulder Peak, Boulder 70.3, Harvest Moon, and of course Ironman Boulder, the city is home to numerous pro triathletes, and it isn't uncommon at all to be out on a training ride or run and come across the likes of Miranda Carfay, Julie Dibbins, Tim Don, or Joe Gambles, amongst many others. For many years, the WTC actually stayed away from Boulder, fearful that athletes would be scared away by the altitude. When they finally brought a full-distance race to the city in 2014, it was a huge success. Fueled mostly by the pent-up demand in triathlon crazy Colorado, it still drew competitors from lower elevation states as well, and reviews of the course were generally pretty positive. Even early on, though, there were issues. Colorado has incredibly fickle weather in the summer, and the first few years of the race, when it was held in August, competitors were exposed to blistering heat in the midday and violent thunderstorms in afternoons. A switch of dates to June, with the 70.3 race flipping to August, helped a little bit, but hot weather remained an issue in each year that the race was held. An additional concern was a lack of community support. While the city of Boulder embraced the race, the surrounding more rural communities who were most impacted by the bike course most certainly did not. And this led to an annual airing of grievances about the race in local press and increasing outward hostility by drivers towards cyclists in the months leading up to the race. Inevitably, participant numbers declined, and when it was time to consider renewing the contract, the WTC made the business decision to not do that. I think this is terribly sad, but of course understandable. I really do think that Boulder should have an Ironman race, and that in time, one will likely return. The continued huge success of the 70.3 race makes me optimistic in this regard. I'd hope, though, that should the race return at some point down the line, that local organizers will learn from this experience and consider changes for the next go-around. For what it's worth, here's what I would retain and what I would change about this race should it reappear in the future. As logistically difficult as a point-to-point race is, the setup for the last two iterations of the Boulder Ironman was actually pretty good. Swim at the reservoir, have T1 and T2 out there as well, and then finish in Boulder proper, with bikes being efficiently and quickly transported into town for post-race pickup. After several attempts, I think the organizers got onto a fairly good bike course. Challenging, but not as crazy as many lowlanders expected, with enough speedy parts to make for pretty fast times for the better cyclists. My one issue with the course, and the one thing that I would definitely change, was the confusion sowed by the out-and-back loop on the diagonal highway. Now, if you aren't local or have not done the race, it's hard for me to explain the problem, but suffice it for me to say that the nature of this one section of the course and the difficulty to effectively communicate to athletes how exactly to navigate it between the first and second laps resulted in far too many disqualifications. The 70.3 is plagued by a similarly confusing element, and I wish that the race organizers there would figure out a way to dispense with it as well. Although the run on the Boulder bike path for the Ironman is a breeze for organizers to manage, it's anything but for participants. It's not a particularly interesting course, nor is it easy to run with a hard surface and numerous tight corners, not to mention the fact that the path is open to the public, who frequently make it a point to be in the way in order to assert their right to be there. Boulder is a lovely city with gorgeous views of the mountains. Take advantage of that by designing a course that exploits that. Yes, it will require street closures of some type. Yes, it will require more police presence in order to control corners and intersections. However, it's such a great place to have a race. This could only make it better and more attractive for participants to come and sign up. Finally, should the race return, I really hope that it will be in September May would be another possible choice, but there's still the risk of hail or snow in that month, and the reservoir would likely be too cold to swim in. In September, the, months are, the mornings are cool, but daytime hires are much better than June or August. Well, that's my wish list, but at the very top of it, of course, is to see an Ironman back in Colorado, and hopefully sometime soon. On the show today, Lisa Bentley had an incredible career as a professional triathlete at both the 70.3 and Ironman distances over two decades. And incredibly, she did it all while living with cystic fibrosis. 
Now retired, Lisa is a coach, author, and motivational speaker, and a beacon of hope for patients and their families affected by the same disease. She joins me to discuss all of that and how she helps triathletes use her experiences to be better themselves. The triathlete Routard goes to Michigan for the Steelhead 70.3 race. This popular Midwestern race is a mainstay in the half Ironman calendar, and I'm joined by one of the professionals who raced there this year to talk about it. First up, though, If you've been paying any attention at all, you have seen how the weather has been having an impact on sports of all kinds, but especially on triathlon, where temperatures have been soaring across many venues. Triple digits were recorded at both Ironman Frankfurt and Ironman Nice on one weekend recently, and this kind of heat can have an important impact on athletes trying to perform. In the medical segment of the podcast, I discuss how the body handles heat and how we can improve our performance in hot weather. After an uncharacteristically non-existent spring, summer has officially entrenched itself here in the Rocky Mountain Front Range. And as expected, the days have become increasingly warmer, and training in this kind of environment brings with it a lot of challenges. So for this episode, I'm not answering a specific listener question, but rather tackling a subject that I know is foremost in the minds of almost all athletes from June through September, and that is, how can I manage my training and racing in the heat? To help listeners best understand the approach to maximizing performance in hot environments, let's first look at some of the basic concepts of environmental heat exposure and human adaptations to that. When we talk about heat, what we are really talking about is a combination of air temperature, humidity, wind speed, and sun exposure. All of these can independently have important impacts on how an individual perceives temperature, but together the interplay of each of these have important effects. For example, you are likely familiar with the concept of how a thermometer can give a reading of a certain temperature, but your handy weather application will provide a second readout that says something along the lines of what it actually feels like. The main determinant of any difference between these two numbers will tend to be the humidity. So for friends of mine who might live in, say, I don't know, Delaware, on a day when the thermometer reads 90, it might feel like 100, but here in Denver, 90 will feel like 90. And the reason for this discrepancy is simply because in Delaware, the humidity might be 85%, while here in Denver, it's like 50%, if that. Now, wind and cloud cover can also impact how we perceive temperature, because wind impacts cooling, and cloud cover can decrease skin temperature, especially in less humid environments. Now, let's turn our attention to how the human body manages to keep cool. As warm-blooded organisms, we mammals have developed very elaborate ways to keep our core temperatures pretty constant across a range of environmental conditions. This is important because bodily functions are dependent on an operating temperature range that's actually pretty narrow. Too cold or too hot, and things tend to break down pretty quickly. Unfortunately, we triathletes often do our very best to overwhelm these finely tuned homeostatic mechanisms. Now, an analogy that I like to use for this topic is to think of the body and how it operates similarly to car engines. We ingest fuels, we burn them to provide both energy and heat, and then harness various cooling systems in order to shed that heat. Like a car, if anything goes wrong with the engine or any of the parts of the cooling system, overheating can occur and the engine, in this case the person, will fail. When we exert ourselves, no matter what the external environment, we begin to produce excess heat, and so the cooling process kicks into overdrive. The transfer of heat from a warmer body to a cooler one can occur in one of four ways. First, there is radiation. Have you ever stood next to someone who has just finished a high-intensity workout or been next to someone who has a fever? You can literally feel the heat coming off of them. That's what radiation cooling is. Basically, infrared energy is being shed from the overheated individual into the cooler air around them. Now, this is not a particularly efficient way of shedding heat, but it does have a role. A second method of transferring heat from a warm person to the environment around them is conduction. When you touch a metal surface, it feels quite cool. The reason for this is that metal is an excellent thermal conductor. Essentially, thermal energy is transferred directly from you to the piece of metal that you are touching. Now, conduction is also quite an inefficient means of cooling, but again, just like radiation, still does play a small role. The third means of cooling that the body employs is evaporative, and here's where we get into the really important means of heat management. When fluid evaporates from a surface, it cools the surface that it is evaporating from. By producing sweat, our bodies can pour fluid onto the skin, where it is then evaporated, thus removing heat. 
Now, the fourth means of cooling is less about our bodies and much more about the environment around us, and that is convective cooling. Convective cooling refers to the movement of air or fluid, like water, over the surface that is being cooled. Think of it this way. If you're in a hot room, the air feels suffocating and warm. If you introduce a fan to this room, even though the temperature of the air does not change, the simple movement of the air improves the cooling effect and makes the air feel cooler, even though the temperature has not changed at all. The way convective cooling works is by continuously replenishing the air that is immediately adjacent to your skin, with a new layer of air that is ever so slightly cooler than the air it just displaced. When the air is still, heat is transferred from your body to that air via all the means I just described, radiation, conduction, and evaporation. Until the air next to your skin can no longer absorb any more heat because that air is now heated up to a similar temperature as your body. If you move that air around, you cause the heated air to then be replaced by environmental air that has more capacity to remove heat and so it feels cooler. Convective cooling is the most efficient means of cooling, mostly because it accentuates all of the other ways that the body employs to shed heat. So now, let's return to the car analogy to think about how the body will take the heat from our engine and utilize radiation, conduction, and evaporation to disperse the generated heat from doing exercise. In a car, coolant fluid circulates through the engine and is carried by hoses to a radiator that has a large surface area for air to pass over, and heat is rapidly exchanged from liquid to the air before the fluid returns to the engine to pick up more heat. The whole process is facilitated by a coolant pump, and failure in any one of these components results in rapid overheating of the engine. In the body, the coolant fluid is simply the blood. The hoses through which the blood travels are the arteries and the veins, and the radiator is the skin, while the pump that moves the blood along is of course your heart. And all of these have to be in good functioning order for core temperature to be effectively regulated. With increasing exertion in warm environments, the demands on the heart in, in particular are very impressive. And this is because large amounts of blood flow have to be diverted to the skin for cooling, while at the same time, the blood flow that's needed by those hardworking muscles has to continue apace. So you can begin to imagine how various ailments can impact effective cooling. Those with heart problems or vascular disease have issues with the pumps or hoses and thus cannot effectively get adequate blood flow to their radiator or the skin. People with serious skin diseases have defective radiators and so even if the uh, blood flow is adequate, they cannot shed heat properly. Finally, people who have low blood volumes, usually from dehydration, are lacking the coolant that they so desperately need and they too have issues with regulating their body temperature. So dehydration has an important impact both in reducing the amount of coolant, but also in decreasing sweat production, further impairing heat loss by decreasing evaporative cooling. Now most athletes are going to be unencumbered by these particular disease processes and so should have fairly effective temperature regulation. Eventually though, athletes can get themselves into serious trouble, especially when ambient temperatures and humidity rise to dangerous levels. The main things that athletes can do to prevent medical heat emergencies are to stay properly hydrated and avoid training when the temperatures are really high. Unfortunately, as we saw with Ironman Frankfurt and Ironman Nice, races can take place under these kinds of conditions, so we need to be prepared. Fortunately, there are a few things that we can do to help our body's ability to deal with heat production and management, and these strategies are collectively known as heat acclimation. Now, there are various method, methods of acclimating to heat, and I'm going to get to those in a second. But regardless of which method an athlete chooses, the mechanisms by which heat acclimation works to make an athlete better able to tolerate high temperatures and indeed have improved performances in such environments are all the same. First, plasma volume is increased. In other words, the amount of coolant in the body is increased. Second, the body secretes sweat at a higher temperature and in lower amounts and in a more dilute form. Effectively, the body through acclimation learns to conserve both water and salt. And lastly, heat acclimation increases the concentration of heat shock proteins in the blood and in the cells. Basically, heat shock proteins are intracellular proteins that protect against the destructive changes that are seen with increasing temperatures. Now the methods to heat acclimate are fairly straightforward, but not necessarily easily done by everyone. The single best method is simply to exercise in a hot environment for at least an hour a day for at least 14 days in a row. Now clearly, if you live in a cold climate, this can be problematic. 
Fortunately, the regimen can be simulated by using a heated room or by wearing extra layers of clothing and working out indoors. Other methods of heat acclimation not employing exercise have also been looked at and actually have been shown to have pretty positive effects, albeit not as positive as exercising in a hot environment. Post-exercise sauna treatments for 30 minutes or hot tub sessions after exercise for 40 minutes for 14 days in a row have been shown to have similar effects. These aren't that easy to do, but with practice and plenty of water on hand can be built up to and are actually effective regimens of heat acclimation. The best part of heat acclimation is that while it takes two weeks to get the effects, those effects last as long as a month afterwards. In addition, it has been shown that dry heat acclimation confers wet heat performance improvement, and the reverse is true as well. Finally, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about strategies for staying cool while racing in hot weather and what to watch out for as potential danger signs of heat exhaustion, which is a true medical emergency. As I mentioned earlier, the regulation of core temperature is a balance between the amount of heat being produced and the ability of the body to shed excess heat to the environment. As the environment becomes hotter, heat loss strategies become less effective. This can be compounded by an absence of wind and increasing humidity. Athletes need to be cognizant of the environment and be prepared to decrease their effort in order to decrease the amount of heat they are producing so as to be able to safely complete the race. Hydration and salt intake are of the utmost importance, and utilizing aid stations to cool down should be further prioritized over any time lost doing so. A minute to take on some ice and additional water can be easily made up by an increased possible pace later on, versus not slowing to cool down and overheating to the point of a DNF. Wearing lighter colored long sleeve clothing can also be important. While long sleeves seem counterintuitive because they cover the skin and can impair cooling in some ways, the additional fabric actually reduces sun exposure and heating. Furthermore, wetting the sleeves can provide for evaporative cooling of the arms. When racing in the heat, athletes need to be aware of the dangers of heat exhaustion and worse, heat stroke. These two medical heat emergencies occur when the body's cooling mechanisms are overwhelmed and the core temperature begins to rise to dangerous level. The first sign of heat exhaustion are profound thirst, lack of sweating, and inability to continue exertion. If left unchecked, this can progress to heat stroke, which is a true life-threatening emergency that manifests as confusion, seizures, and multiple end organ failure. If, as an athlete, you recognize that you have stopped sweating, this should be taken as a serious warning, and you need to seek attention right away. Do you have a question for the TriDoc to answer on the podcast? Email it to me at tri underscore doc at iCloud.com. My guest today is an absolute legend in triathlon and very much one of my main inspirations for being in the sport as long as I have been. When I first started back in 2000, it was the heyday of Canadian domination of Ironman racing by the likes of Peter Reed, Heather Fuhr, Laurie Bowden, and my guest today. Lisa Bentley raced for 20 years as a professional triathlete. During that time, Lisa became one of Canada's best triathletes and was ranked top five in the world for over a decade. She won 11 Ironman and 16 Ironman 70.3 races. She had several top five finishes at the Ironman World Championships in Hawaii. She represented Canada on multiple national teams and finished sixth at the Pan American Games in 1995. But the most amazing fact is that in reality, she shouldn't have won any of them. And that's because she has cystic fibrosis, a life-threatening genetic lung disease. Because of that, Lisa considers her most significant and important accolade as a beacon of hope for families with CF. Since retiring from professional sport, Lisa authored her first book, An Unlikely Champion, and has delivered motivational speeches across North America. She teaches audiences how to turn adversity into mastery and fires them up to be their best self every day. She has done sports commentary work with the Canadian Broadcast Corporation, the Canadian Television Network, TSN, which is Canada's version of ESPN, and Sportsnet for the Olympics and triathlon. She's an ambassador for the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation as well. Lisa has an honors degree from the University of Waterloo in math and computer science and a bachelor's of education from the University of Western Ontario and taught high school for seven years prior to pursuing sport full-time in 1999. Lisa was inducted into the Etobicoke Sports Hall of Fame in 2012 and into Triathlon Canada's Hall of Fame in September of 2014. Amazingly, she continues to run marathons as an elite master's athlete with her best time of 2.47 at 46 years of age at the Boston Marathon. But today, she has slowed down long enough to join me on the TriDoc podcast, and I am absolutely thrilled. Lisa, thank you so much for being my guest. 
Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. And thanks for all that you do in our, the medical community. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Lisa, uh, it, you know, growing up, well, growing up, like I was already grown, but, uh, you know, coming into the sport, seeing your domination, not realizing that you uh, had CF, you obviously managed to do what so many others try to, and that is not be defined by your illness. <laughs> How do you help other people do the same thing, not be defined by a chronic illness? I suppose I really uh, just try to relay the message of not being defined by your challenges, uh, but let your challenges be opportunities. So whether it be chronic illness or whether it be uh, some you know family situation, some event in your life which is seem, may seem paralyzing, Whatever obstacle is confronting you, it's so easy to become defined by that. And so what I've learned through the years is that I'm happiest when I am not. And I mean, just if you think about uh, marriage and se- or, you know separation, divorce, all those kinds of things, terrible things that happen in people's lives. And it's so easy to become defined by them and say, I can't never be happy again. Um, but there's a point where you say, I'm not going to let that take my joy away from X, Y, or Z. So I am still going to be a great mother or I'm going to be a great father or I'm going to be great at my job. And yeah, that my, my partner or ex-partner can take so much joy from me, but they're not going to take that, um, all of my joy. And I guess that's how I confronted CF. And now granted I was diagnosed, I was, you know, a 20 years old. So I felt indestructible and I felt like nothing could get in my way. But I just thought of it as, oh, fantastic. Now when I get sick, the doctors are going to know what's wrong with me. And I'm not going to have to go through the whole process of, you know, what, oh, you can't go on antibiotics yet. We have to try to, you know, fight it off. And we're not sure what bug you're growing. Whereas now I get sick, we know what bugs I'm growing, we can target it right away. And and really get myself on the road to recovery. And if I'm not getting healthy fast enough, they act immediately to get me healthy. So, you know, I kind of see the benefits of it. And of course, it's not great to have a chronic illness, but I just always said I was going to do the best I could with my deck of cards. And what was my option to not do a sport I loved? And and that wasn't an option. And I I use that metaphor in a sense with people who are nervous pre-race. Uh, we just had the Subaru Ironman 70.3 Mont Tremblant on the weekend. And, you know, I came across many athletes who were like almost paralyzed by their fear of the event. And I said, well, here's the option. You don't race. Is that an option? And they're like, oh, no. I'm like, well, there you go. Like we have an opportunity here to come out on the other side of fear and turn fear into opportunity. So, you know, that's how I approach CF. That's how I approach other obstacles in my life. But you know, I, I, early days uh, that uh, everyone, when I was early in my racing career, everyone wanted to talk about CF. I had, would have newspaper editors which would want to do a story on it. And I declined because I didn't want to be defined as a person with CF. I wanted to, to find my stride as an athlete. And I didn't want to just be that sad case. And I didn't want to have an excuse, a built-in excuse. So I, in the early days, I was like, you don't want you don't want to interview me because I'm a good athlete. You want to interview me because I'm a good story. And that doesn't work for me. I need to become a good enough athlete that you want to interview me on my athletic basis. And then I'll be very happy to talk about cystic fibrosis and help other people to accomplish their goals as someone with chronic illness. Wow. So you said a lot of things in there that I want to kind of dive into a little more. First of all, I just want to say I love that analogy for the person who's nervous before a race because, yeah, yeah, I mean, I I think we encounter that a lot. Uh, You know, I've started coaching as well, and I I see that in my athletes. And you're absolutely right. Giving them that option probably helps them sort of see that really what they're afraid of is is it's it's almost not silly, but it's it's we make choices in life and, and what they're afraid mm-hmm. of is the choice they've made and now they just have mm-hmm. to embrace it. So uh, I mm-hmm. think that's a really, really nice approach. Um, you were diagnosed at 20. That's very yeah. unusual. Uh, most know. people are diagnosed as infants or early in childhood. How how did you make it all the way to 20 without being <laughs> diagnosed? 
Well, you know, back in when I was born, there was no um, newborn screening. So I would have bypassed that. And nowadays there's newborn screening, which is incredible. I just met a couple at the uh, Subaru Triathlon Series that said that their child was seven months old and had been just diagnosed with CF. And I said, how did they find it? And they said, oh, there's newborn screening. And they found him right away. Like, of course, he had no symptoms. He was just a little tiny baby. Um, So anyway, there was no newborn screening. I was always sick as a kid. And we never knew why. And uh, my father... um, my, my, my parents were, you know, the generation where you didn't have a high education. They worked uh, blue collar workers kind of thing. And my dad basically would take his paycheck at the end of the week and he'd go to the pharmacy and buy antibiotics for three out of four of his kids. And that was the end of his $35 paycheck. And that was basically growing up. And I remember the pharmacist saying to my dad, you know, you realize your daughter's been on antibiotics for nine months now. And my, my dad would be like, yeah, <laughs> she's sick. And, um, you know, I'd, we blamed a lot on allergies. I would cough up blood and the belief was it was allergies. And so we kind of went through that process for a long time. And uh, the only reason I was diagnosed was because my sister had been coughing up blood in her, tw- she was in her 20s. And they sent her for the whole gamut of tests, tuberculosis, cancer, et cetera. And they said, okay, this is a long shot, but we're going to send her for a sweat chloride test for cystic fibrosis. And it came back positive. Uh, And so therefore, all of my brothers and sisters were were checked. And um, three out of four of us came back with cystic fibrosis. Which is what you would expect in in that kind of genetic illness. Now, is your variant more mild because yes. again yeah it must be okay cuz yes. cuz you were yes. yeah. you were very athletically talented you were able to do a sport that requires a lot of pulmonary function and and yes. yeah okay uh, because yes. my my wife's a pediatric surgeon and okay. uh, she sees babies who have like meconium ileus which is a a, yeah. a problem that kids with um, cystic fibrosis can develop and the more severe variants. And that's mm-hmm. without genetic screening. That's just uh, something that kids right. will get that will lead people to test for CF. So that's why yeah. I was curious about being diagnosed so late. So yes, that's fascinating. Yeah. I also wonder, yeah. I also wonder, you know, being diagnosed late means, you know, we see a lot of uh, overprotective parents. And yeah. when you uh, have a child who's got a chronic illness, then you wonder if, you know, the kind of parenting that people do now would prevent a child from being exposed to the kind of athletics that you got into. And, and I, you know, yeah. that, that would be too bad. Totally. hundred yeah. percent. And, you know, when I speak to groups, that's one of the things that I say was such a blessing was I was allowed to play. You know, I took skating lessons. We went skiing. We did all of the things. The only difference was every March, because we were all sick, my parents would drive to Florida and throw us in the salt water for a couple of weeks, and we'd all come back healthy. Mm. And ironically, you know, hypertonic sailing, which is inhaling sodium chloride, or sodium, I think it's sodium chloride, but you inhale sodium, is one of the therapies that I do sometimes. So right. your mom and dad mom and dad were far brighter than, um, than, than right. many right. by throwing us in the ocean. So, yeah. Right. And uh, the other thing you mentioned that I wanted to come back to was this notion that at first you really wanted to be defined as an athlete before you talked about cystic fibrosis. But I know that later in your career, um, Mm -hmm. you started to be much more upfront about it. It became important to you. Was that transition facilitated by the fact that, you know, you had established yourself as a champion and you no longer felt you had anything to prove and now you felt more comfortable sort of addressing the CF part? Yes, in part it did. And in part, it was really finding purpose in my racing. So I I started racing in 1989. And 1997, I switched to Ironman. And 2000, I won my first Ironman. And I was so happy. And then I continued and I wanted to keep winning. And I went and I won Ironman New Zealand. And I remember winning it in the year later. So now I was a two-time Ironman champion. And it really felt quite empty. And I was like, hmm, like, it's a big deal, you know, like you just want an Ironman and a lot has to go right to cross that finish line first. And why do you feel so unfulfilled? And I really looked in my heart and it wasn't run split, bike split, heart rate. It was really looking in my heart and saying there has to be more to it than crossing the finish line first. And I realized that 
me racing was going to offer hope to families. And I think because I have a mild uh, genetic mutation that I never took myself seriously about being a person with CF. I almost thought that I was a bit of, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, like not, not a joke by any straight, uh, by any uh, statement, but almost like, oh yeah, well, like Lisa's not super sick. And I thought I'm almost making um, a mockery of it's, a very it's serious called, disease. It's called imposter syndrome. Uh, we, <laughs> I mean, that's literally what it is. I yeah. mean, we yeah. see that in medicine. Uh, residents yeah. uh, feel like they don't belong uh, because yeah. they feel like, you know, I'm not good enough to be a doctor. What am I doing here? We even see that amongst triathletes who, who right. like, you know, what am I doing at the top of the age group? I, I'm not that good. And what mm-hmm. you're describing is the same thing. Uh, you mm-hmm. have CF, but you feel like well, I'm not sick enough. And who am I to say I have CF? Yes. Yeah. And that's how I kind of felt. And then when I was confronted with a situation where I felt like, Hey, I I need to do way more than just cross the finish line at the top of the rankings. Like that's not enough for me. And I realized that hope comes in different forms. And if you're diagnosed, you know, my mother-in-law was diagnosed with liver cancer at 68 years of age and it was very serious and there was a woman who was 30 years old who had a similar cancer and had the surgery and had the chemo and she lived so that was hope it didn't matter that this was a 30 year old woman and my mother-in-law was 68 all that mattered was she lived and so when you know a tiny baby is born to a family like that family I met at the Guelph Triathlon a couple of weeks ago, and they came right over to me, mom's eyes filled with tears, and said, our son is seven months old, and he was diagnosed at birth, and we are so happy that you're alive, and you offer us hope. And and that's all they need. They don't need to know my genetic mutation. They don't need to know my lung function. All they need to know is I have CF. I've lived a full, thriving life in a sport where I shouldn't have been successful, and all of a sudden, they have hope for their child, that they're going to be just like me. And it took the, that victory in 2001 and that searching for meaning for me to realize, Hey, I I need to do something with this because you're not always going to be winning. (laughs) And there's got to be equal fulfillment to cross the finish line first, third, 10th, last. And how am I going to find that fulfillment by being a little bit of hope for people with chronic illness and cystic fibrosis? So how do you continue to parlay that today? How do you, uh, besides doing your motivational speaking, uh, how, how did this family know of you? Where, where are you involved? Well, I think it's sort of just a bit out there. Like I know someone told me about five years ago that they Googled um, celebrities. And I, I don't call myself a celebrity, but they Googled celebrities with CF over 40. And my name came up (laughs) and I'm like, okay, well, who thought you could just Google something like that? So I think that's one thing. And, uh, and then of course it's now more out there when I get interviewed and in podcasts and of course through my book and, um, I've done several talks for the CF foundation and I, you know, even when I was doing sports commentary for CBC, uh, my co-host would, would say, Hey, Lisa, you know, you have a, an incredible vehicle here to, relay a message. And and last summer I did a talk for Tim Hortons and they said, if you want to do something to raise money for CF, we're more than happy to support that. So I I think it's just in the getting out there as long as I'm out there and I'm involved and that's what I I do tend to do. So that's how it it, it really gets out there. And also the doctors at the CF clinic at St. Mike's hospital, which are phenomenal. They, um, when, when they meet a patient and if they think there's something I can do to help, then they ask me if it's okay and we connect by email. So I'm, uh, I'm definitely uh, using, you know, the people that I know to, to hopefully help others. That's great. Um, I want to go back a little bit to uh, something I mentioned earlier uh, before we started talking, and that was uh, this idea that, you know, when you were racing, uh, you, you would 
have uh, frequently setbacks just because you would get sick mm -hmm. with like a cold mm -hmm. and that would knock you out for quite a long time. Um, mm -hmm. How did you learn to deal with those setbacks? I know like, you know, age groupers who have full-time jobs and will often have one A race, you know, they, mm -hmm. it, it can be devastating if something goes awry, they get an injury or an illness that prevents them from being able to perform. How did you learn to deal with those frequent setbacks that you would have that would keep you out of Kona and, uh, you know, the, that you would have to come back from and be able to, to keep your positive attitude? I, I really uh, looked at, I, I really used the mental power, to be honest, to rise above illness. And so I, when I would get sick, it's almost like that conversation you have with an athlete who's afraid on the start line is, okay, what's my options here to not race? And so I would get sick and I would say to myself, okay, you know, you don't have to race, but I want to race and I'm happy to race at 75%. And so I kind of do the mental preparation where I would love my whole self. And I'd say even the very fact that I'm racing right now in a reduced lung capacity state is better than not racing. So there were, there were times like that. So I actually never missed a race because of a chest infection, but I definitely had to rise above it. So the, you know, one that stood out was in 2000 and four I was quite sick before the race and felt very sorry for myself and then realized that I was so lucky to be able to race to to race the best women in the world in the most important race in my sport and what a blessing and I had cystic fibrosis and I thought to myself you know this is God's test to you to really be an advocate for CF like if you really this champion of CF and and an athletic champion, then you better go champion this darn illness and get on that start line and be the best you can be with your deck of cards. And on that particular day, I, I actually had the race of my life and came in fourth place. And I was very sick the next day and for several weeks after. And I was very sick the days before. And I was taking ciprofloxin, which is terrible thing to be antibiotic to be taking when you're racing an Ironman uh, because of the t Achilles tendon rupture and the sunburn and the all that. Um, but, you know, I was able, you know, mentally, because I put myself on that start line and thought of it as a blessing. So that entire day, all I thought of was the heat is a blessing. The wind is a blessing. I'm so lucky I get to race here. And me at 70% is better than a bunch of people at a hundred percent. And I just had to believe that. And I did, um, you know, that, that's a, was a great example. And then really the last race of my professional career, I was in the same situation and yet not because I'd been sick for months. Uh, it was a really bad year, 2009. I was, uh, taking inhaled therapies every day. I was on antibiotics for several months and I would be basically in the morning doing uh, my nebulizer with, um, uh, uh, I can't remember the name of the drug, but it was to kill pseudomonas. I was growing pseudomonas and I was taking the inhaled therapies in the morning and then going and racing at a high level. And my lung function kept dropping and dropping and dropping. And it was you know, probably uh, by the time I was on my last race, I think my lung function was about 72%. And it wasn't just an infection-based 72%. It was, it had been like 90, then 80, then 60, then, then 80, 75, then 72. And it was dropping and dropping and dropping. And the doctors that, and I was really struggling to breathe, really struggling. And the doctors at the CF clinic said, I know you're going to race, but you know, like we really want to admit you into hospital for mm -hmm. intravenous. Like your lung function has dropped almost 30%. And, and I said, you know, this is my last race. I'm going to retire. I know I have to, I know I have to put my health first because of course there was talk of putting me on um, steroids to help with the inflammation. Of course, I couldn't be on steroids if I was going to be racing. So I said, I mean, this is my last race. I think it's quite fitting that the last race of my professional career is in Muskoka, which is kind of home to me. And um, I'm just going to, I'm just going to do it. No expectation. And I went into the race and so no one, like people didn't really know, but 
they were, you know, I got off the bike well back and people were so worried, like, did Lisa crash? Did... Mm. But my perceived effort was there. Like, it felt like I was racing at the front of the race. I was working as hard as I could. I got onto the half marathon. I was coughing up blood. So I decided that I was just going to walk, run and just get it done. And that was, you know, that's my retirement. That was my last race. I finished the race. I have no idea what place I came in. I didn't feel sick or anything. It was just the reality of it. And from there, I went and tried some more therapies, antibiotics. And by January the next year, I was um, in hospital and on IV uh, for five weeks. So it's a uh, uh, long, long answer to it. But I, I sort of just did my deck of cards. And I thought, hey, isn't it quite fitting that my whole career, I've tried to be an advocate for being the best you can be with whatever it is, chronic illness, life, uh, emotion. And it's quite fitting that I retire when I've really got all the baggage of my disease on my shoulders right now. I desperately want to be an elite athlete, but my genetics are saying, listen, girl, your lungs aren't happy with you right now. <laughs> and I just decided, okay, well, I, instead of going out on top in terms of winning, I'm going to go out on top in terms of effort. <laughs> and I'm just going to go do this race the best that I can. And then my health becomes a priority, which it did following that race in 2009. And I'm going to guess that you had the trademark smile at the finish, <laughs> like always, because that's how I will always remember you racing. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> Lisa Bentley was a professional triathlete for 20 years. During that time, she had 27 titles at the Ironman and Ironman 70.3 distance. She is now an author uh, with her first book, An Unlikely Champion. I will have the link to that in the show notes. She's also a coach, a motivational speaker, and today was my guest on the TriDoc Podcast. Lisa Bentley, thank you so much for joining me and sharing some of those wonderful stories. Thank you. And now it's time once again for the Triathlete Routard, that segment of the program when I'm joined by a guest to discuss and provide a kind of travel guide to one of the popular races on the WTC calendar. On this episode, I'm going to be talking about the popular and long-standing race in Benton Harbor, Michigan, the Steelhead 70.3. And joining me to talk about this race is a good friend of the podcast, second-year professional triathlete Maddie Pesch. Maddie was my guest on an earlier episode, and I'm thrilled to have her back to discuss this Northwestern race sandwiched between Chicago and Detroit. Maddie's had an incredibly successful year so, racing so far in 2019, with a fourth place finish at the Challenge Race in Cancun this past April, and seventh at the Steelhead 70.3 this past weekend, where she earned herself a slot to the 70.3 World Championships in Nice, France, this coming September. Maddie's a member and coach uh, for the Team Sirius Tri Club. Welcome to the podcast once again, Maddie, and congratulations on this past weekend. Hi, Jeff. Thanks so much for having me on to talk about Steelhead. And I'm a huge fan of the podcast, love the content. So happy to listen and also contribute. Well, thank you. So uh, looking at this race, um, is this one of those races that signs up quickly? Or is this one that people can kind of wait on to decide and sign up at the last minute? Um, I actually I do think that the race was sold out. For the age groupers, I had a friend who was trying to sign up, I believe, a couple months prior, and it was already sold out by then. I think the reason being that um, there aren't too many races in the Midwest. So I know that I was traveling from Madison, which is about a four-hour drive, and Steelhead is probably uh, like the closest race to us right now. So I think that we have a lot of folks coming from, as you said, Chicago, Detroit, but then also nearby states coming from Wisconsin and Iowa. So I do think it's probably one to try to sign up in advance if you can. Right. And like you said, there's not a lot of races up there. I guess you've got Racine. You now have Wisconsin. Uh, there is the uh, Muncie race. And I guess a, a Columbus now has a race, but that's not really that far north. That's much further south. So I guess that's really about it in that area, isn't it? Well, actually, we've had um, Racine and the other one that you mentioned, uh, Muncie. Yep. Or Muncie's still on, but Racine is no longer a race. Okay. Um, and we are happy in the Midwest that Des Moines is going to be hosting the uh, North American Championship. So, of course, that's going to bring more racing to the Midwest. But, yeah, for the Wisconsin folks, I mean, it's great to have the one in Madison and Steelhead's kind of the next one on the calendar. 
All right. So you mentioned you drove from uh, Madison and it was four hours. It looks like it's a pretty quick drive if you're going from Chicago or Detroit and I guess Indianapolis as well. Uh, is there an, a local airport if people were flying in? Um, I believe I, I heard that most people did actually fly into Chicago, those who were flying. Um, so if you fly into Chicago, you can pretty much just rent a car and I believe it'd be about a two hour drive. Um, I'm, I think any airport that would be closer would be uh, pretty small. And then what about uh, logistics related to bringing your gear? Uh, does Tri-Bike Transport service this race or is this one where you'd have to bring it on the plane? Yep, there was a Tri-Bike Transport booth there. So I think they're they're doing it for this one. Okay. Where is there to stay? Is it a pretty big town? Lots of lodging options? I believe it is a fairly uh, small area, but it also is like the race is right by a, a small town, St. Joseph, but everywhere around that area is very popular for summer tourism. So there are certainly lots of places to stay. Um, if that would be kind of in like your kind of like beach house, lake house type of deal, um, or if it would be in one of the local hotels. Um, the race isn't close to like a major city, but since it's right on the lake, I think there are plenty of accommodations. And given that it's a small town and given that you're having people probably staying in cottages, like you said, all over the place, is getting to and from the race venue become a problem and specifically race morning? Uh, getting to the race was actually very smooth. Um, you would probably have to drive to the race site unless you would somehow bike there in the dark. But um, once you got to the race site, they had lots and lots of parking. It's on the um, Whirlpool Corporation headquarters. And so they had lots of parking lots that were just empty. And then from there, you can take um, shuttle services that go to the park and the shuttles were really well run ran very regularly so I would say really no trouble with that at all cool that's great and then I guess afterwards they could wash all of your dirty race kits um, I don't think they provide <laughs> <laughs> come on the thing the race is sponsored by Maytag I, I would have thought for sure <laughs> I'll talk to them about adding that uh, yeah so uh, when, uh, I mean, you mentioned that it's a popular summer tourist area, so I imagine people would want to consider potentially getting there early and spending some time in the area. Aside from the lake activities, is there anything else to see and do in that area? I mean, certainly if you would want to go to, if you haven't been to Chicago before, I mean, of course, there are lots of things to do there. Um, I I grew up in um, Minnesota, so I'm kind of used to like the lake life. And I certainly think just having a few extra days after the race or anything to enjoy the beach would certainly be very enjoyable if you can do some of the water activities there or um, the, the so with Lake Michigan and everything, the lake was just beautiful. I mean, the beach was like the sand was like being at the ocean. It wasn't like dirty sand. The water was clean. Um, and it's not, the water wasn't too cold this year, even though it was colder than other years. So it certainly is a nice place to like, to bring the family. You can have a beach day, get ice cream afterwards. And yeah, yeah I would recommend. Okay. Let's turn our attention to the course. Um, the swim of course in Lake Michigan itself, you mentioned that, uh, the water tends to be, uh, I imagine wetsuit legal and the course design itself fairly straightforward. Yeah, I think that most of the time the race is wetsuit legal. They were a little concerned about it being actually even colder this year, but it wasn't bad at all. It was a very nice temperature. I think sometimes you can get some chop in the lake, but this year it was perfectly uh, perfectly flat on the water, and the course is super straightforward. So um, it's just a triangle swim. So swim out, right hand turn, swim a straightaway, right hand turn, and then come back. And they, the sun's coming up a little bit, but I didn't find it to be blinding or anything. It's kind of hidden behind some trees still. Okay. Are you ever swimming directly towards the sun or is the sun just off to your side? Uh, you are swimming towards the sun on that middle straightaway. Okay. But like I said, I still didn't find it difficult to see the buoys. All right. 
of course, it helps when you're out front. <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> yeah. I didn't come up too much more by the time others got out there. Uh, okay, so uh, how about transition? It looks like there's a bit of a run uh, on the beach, it looks like, to get to transition. Yeah, there is a run on the beach. Um, it's certainly not extended an extended run it's basically just the straight distance to get from the water back up to the uh back up to where the paved part of the road is so it's not a far run um the length of transition was pretty long um so you when you're actually running through transition that's a a fairly decent run but it's paved so you're not running on sand at that point in t1 did they have wetsuit strippers um, they did not have the pro for the pro athletes. I'm, I believe they also did not for the age groupers, but I can't confirm a hundred percent. Okay. And, uh, any other specific considerations about T1? You mentioned it's a long transition, but is there anything else, uh, notable about it? Nothing specific. I don't think so I think it was fairly easy to navigate. There were plenty of like land markers as far as recognizing where your stuff is in the transition. So, okay. Uh, Pretty good. All right. And let's move on to the bike. Uh, I looked at the profile of the course yesterday. It looks, I mean, the map itself is pretty straightforward. It uh, looks like it's a rolling course, not a huge amount of elevation gain, but uh, rolling enough to keep you honest. Uh, what, did you, what, did, what struck you about the bike course? Yeah, the course is really nice. Um, it's, it's great. You kind of start out, you go out on the, the blue state highway road and um, then the first part of the course once you get to about mile 15 then you're kind of making some turns for the next 15 or so miles Um, so that's kind of the only part where um, you're really navigating on different roads Uh, but as you said yeah the course it has no major climbs Um, it just has a few like small hills or rollers as you would say but the incline is never very large um I found the aid stations all to be really well run. Um, And the the nice part of the course is once you turn around at, I believe, like about mile 35, there's a 180 degree turn. And then from then, it's basically just 20 miles on the same road. So you can really just put your head down and get into it at that point. And I know you probably didn't see a lot of the age groupers, but maybe on the way back in that uh, straightaway back, you probably would have seen some. Did you notice if there was much drafting going on or packs or anything like that? Um, I thought the course looked a, a tad crowded, but it certainly wasn't overwhelmingly crowded. I would say it was mostly um, people were pretty well spaced out and those that were um, – riding like two abreast were passing someone okay good all right um any danger points on the course was there anywhere that uh except for that 180 at the end of the turnaround was there any point like any of those turns in the turning section that gave you pause for concern uh there is one descent on i believe mile 17 and a half um where you are descending and making a turn directly after that Um, But they marked it well with slow signs um, so that you knew that the turn was coming up. Uh, So that wasn't too dangerous, I would say. There was one part where they had a a little bit of water on the side of the road on the course, but they made sure to make everyone aware of that as well. When you're in that portion where you're making some turns, some of the roads are a little bit more rough, but nothing that is really too troublesome like there weren't really potholes just a little bit of a bumpier road but then once you get back out onto the state highway that route is pretty much smooth the whole way okay and then uh transition two is the same so it's a one transition race Uh, and then how about the run course the run looks very flat very fast Mm -hmm. the run it it is there are let's see basically three hills you have to run up So you go out into the lollipop course, and when you're doing, like, the stick of the lollipop, um, there's one big hill, right, like, at that first mile mark that you run up. But it's it's a steep hill, but it's a pretty short hill. So get up that one, and then you get to the portion of the course where you're doing 
uh, two loops. And at the end of each of those two loops, there's another hill to climb. But again, it's basically just a steep, short hill. So kind of just get up that and then the rest of the course is, as you say, flat. So coming back, I guess, when you're heading back to the finish, you get to go down that big hill, which is probably a nice, yeah. nice push to get you towards the finish. Uh, how about uh, just overall perceptions, uh, scenery, uh, the weather? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I really, I really enjoyed the run course um, because when you're in that center portion where you're doing the loops, uh, you're running through the Whirlpool campus and they take you – like it, it's on a little trail. It's actually on a paved trail. Um, you you may have to watch your footing at times because it's not um, an ex- it's not a perfectly smooth trail, although it is flat. But I found that part kind of fun. You get some shade. There are points where you have shade on the course, and um, it's kind of nice to just change it up with some turns and things rather than having uh, long straightaways. Mm-hmm. I think I, I like that kind of course better. Um, I do know that it got to be a fairly hot day and there was some humidity. I think that can certainly be a factor on this course. Um, I would say that the the aid stations were very well run with, they had ice out there, um, when I was out there. And so I, the day also, it kind of peaked around noon and it did cool down after that. Um, a little bit so but I think it it is a little bit of a gamble with the weather I mean you could have rain you could have a really hot day you could have a really nice day Um, you don't really know what to expect right around the end of June in the Midwest so yeah yeah and storms I gather can be a a threat as well but usually later in the day yeah in most cases and the community very supportive Uh, were they out there uh, cheering people on Yep. Um, all sorts of different members from the community were out there. Um, they were certainly happy to have us there. Um, lots of, I talked to lots of people from the town and they were all aware of the event. It's a really big event in the area. As I said, it's a small town. And so everyone was really supportive. So that was definitely a good vibe. And, uh, just sort of take home last sort of things is this a race that uh you know you really highly recommend you think people should have on their bucket list yeah for sure i mean it's not one of those super famous races but it is a really nice course like it's really well maintained um the water is beautiful the beach is really nice um the bike course is fast i mean if you're looking for a fast course this is great. I think lots of people have PRs out there and PRs without, you know, having those kind of things about the course that I sometimes think are cheating, like maybe like a downstream swim or something like that. Like this is an honest, very fast course. So I feel like my PR at Chattanooga has just been somewhat (laughs) undermined. (laughs) It's tough, right? Yeah. Yeah. PR, but had a little bit of aid on the current. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably never do better than that, but I'll keep trying. I'll keep trying. <laughs> yeah. uh, Maddie Pesh, thank you so much for joining me to, again on the uh, TriDoc podcast. Maddie's a second year pro uh, on the uh, WTC circuit and also on the challenge circuit. She's headed off to Mexico this weekend. Remind me the name of this race. It's Challenge Sand Hill. Challenge Sand Hill, where she will be competing. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a pro field, but uh, she is going there to try and encourage the organizers to bring back a pro field next year. So kudos to you for that. Thanks again for joining me, and uh, I look forward to talking again sometime in the future. Certainly. Thank you for having me. And that's it for another episode of the TriDoc Podcast. I hope that you enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you. Links to the medical references as well as to everything else discussed on the show can be found in the show notes at www.tridocpodcast.podbean.com. If you have feedback or a question for consideration to be answered on the program, please email me at tri underscore doc at icloud.com. If you're interested in coaching services, please visit www.tridoccoaching.com where you can find a lot of information about me and the services that I provide. The music heard at the beginning and the end of the show is Radio by Empty Hours, 
and is used with permission. This song and many others like it can be found at www.reverbnation.com, where I hope that you will visit and give small independent bands a chance. The TriDoc Podcast will be back again soon with another listener question for me to answer, an interview with a person of interest from the world of triathlon, and another episode of the Triathlete Routel. Until then, train hard, train healthy.